good when I carry two Bibles. <laughs> so get ready. Like I said before, you've come to the right place. Thank you for all being here. And uh, just if you've not been here before, just quick, I wanted to mention that there's restrooms, the men's over here and women's over here. And there's more in the back room where the kids are if you wish to go. So um, this is a good place to be. This is the place to be. Amen. Amen. If you don't know, uh, the last couple weeks I've been sharing on preparing your heart and humbling your heart. And how many of people here want to be used by God? Everybody says yes. It's okay. We all know that. However, not very many people get used by God in the capacity that they want to be used by God. And the first part is, the first, if you want to be used by God, the first thing I've learned is you have to make yourself usable. Yeah. Instead of asking God to use me, and God will want to do this, then God's telling me, I will, but you've got to make yourself usable. Mm -hmm. And the best way to make yourself usable is by preparing your heart. The Bible says, prepare your heart before the Lord. I spent the last couple of weeks sharing on that, and we'll go through that today. Preparing your heart is no more than just saying, God, I love you. It's a preparation. The Bible, David said in Psalms 57, I, my heart is fixed, oh God. I don't have that. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. That same word fixed is word prepared in Hebrew. It's the same word as fixed. It's also the same word that the U is called established. My word has been established towards you. You've got to make a decision to fix your heart towards Jesus. And by doing that, God will prepare your heart. In other words, God will, the Holy Spirit will move in you and your desires will become his desires. And when that happens, then guess what? You can be usable. So when God asks you to go do something, you can go do it. Yes. Everybody wants that, but we so often get sidetracked. I'm not going to go there. You'll have to look it back. But over in uh, First Chronicles, or Second Chronicles, I think. I remember, was it First Chronicles or Second Chronicles? Rehobium. It says, Rehobium did evil in the Lord's sight because he did not prepare his heart before the Lord. He started out good. He was a holy man. He was a God man of God, and he did the right thing. But he fell off, and he went against God. And how many Christians start out good, we love the Lord, but eventually something happens and you don't see them and they go do something different. The reason why that happens is because they didn't take time and take the effort to fix their attention and their imagination and their heart to the Lord and allow the Word of God to grow a root system in their life. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a root system, the first opportunity that comes against you, you're not going to have the system to stand against the world. The world is trying to crush you and anything to get your attention away from Jesus. Mm -hmm. The single most important thing to the enemy is to take your attention away from Jesus. Yeah. If he can get your attention away, that's what because that's going to do what? That's going to unprepare your heart and harden your heart towards God. All he's got to do is get your attention away because he knows you're, you have the authority. And he knows if he figured that out, he's in a bad spot. All he can do and all his weapon is, has to try to deceive you to get you to start thinking away from this. Why do you think they have all these weird holidays coming up soon? Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with this. The whole point is to get your attention away from this. Yeah. The whole thing is all about a, a diversion because he has no authority. In Psalms chapter 10, I'll start here. This is one verse I used yesterday or... Uh, Last week. Psalms chapter 10 says, Lord, thou hast heard the desires of the humble, and that will prepare their heart and will cause thine eye to ear. A humble heart is a heart that wants to be prepared. Now, a lot of times we hear the word humble and you think, Americans just think if, if you say you're humble, you don't you think you're less than or not achieving enough or it just means you're weak or you're poor or things like that. We take that into context. That is the exact opposite of what the Bible means by humble. A humility just means teachable. That's literally what it means. It means teachable. Someone who is willing to open their heart up and allow God to teach them. 
As a matter of fact, they use the word humble in the Bible called meek. They translate that word meekness. Jesus said, the meek will inherit the earth. Does everybody remember that part? Amen. On a certain amount, he said, the meek will inherit the earth. He didn't mean the weak will inherit the earth or the feeble or the poor or all this stuff. He meant the meek, meaning of the person who is willing to fix their heart towards God and willing for God to show them and teach them. Those are the people that God's going to use, and those are the people that are going to rule the earth. Does that make sense? Amen. A person who is meek. In Numbers chapter 12, it says Moses was the meekest plant man on the planet. I think that's Numbers chapter 12, 14. Don't quote me, but it's close somewhere in there. Moses was the meekest man on the planet, which means Moses was the most humble man, the most teachable person alive. Didn't, Moses wasn't weak. You just said right now, Moses was 120 years of age and his eyesight wasn't dim. He was as strong as an ox. He wasn't talking about him being weak. Moses wasn't poor either. He was strong. He was meek. You've probably heard this before, but you know who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses. So Moses wrote himself as the meekest man on the earth. <laughs> He's the one that wrote that. Some of you might think, well, that's kind of arrogant. But if you read through the scriptures, God didn't correct him. He, says, he didn't say, I am. He wrote in third person. He says, Moses was the meekest. Moses is the guy that wrote that, just so you know. Part of maturing as a Christian and growing is growing a root system. And as we mature in your relationship with God, we grow step at a time, step at a time. So this, your, the Word of God works just like a seed. I always talked about this. And it has to grow a root system in you. And the way we do that is to renew my brain to understand what is really happening in my spirit. Because I have a brand new spirit that God's given me everything, but my brain has to be transformed and renewed so I understand that. And the way we, I do that is by fixing my heart, my imagination, or making a decision that I'm going to stick with what the Bible says, regardless of what this person says. If so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so -so -and -so say all this stuff and you can't find it in here and it doesn't line up, then they are wrong. I'm, really, I'm not trying to squash anybody's bugs here, but the Word of God, it has to be first and foremost infallible authority in our life, period. Amen. It has to be true 100% from page one to page end. Yes. There is no part of this Bible we don't do and part of this Bible we don't do. It's either true or it's not, and it's all true all the way from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, I just see so many people that get they start up nice and then they go away, and it's because they don't have a root system. Who there does gardening? Anybody does? You do garden. You do tomatoes. Or, tomatoes are fine. So let me just conduct an experiment. If you have, I'll tell you what's going to happen. If you have two tomato plants, and you put one tomato plant in three inches of soil. And you put one tomato plant in a foot of soil. You know where I'm going with this. And you give them the same amount of water, and you give them the same amount of light, everything is identical, two things are going to happen. The one in the shallow soil, first of all, is going to sprout up real fast. It's going to come real fast. It'll go up real fast, and it'll grow leaves real fast. The one in the deep soil, well, well you won't even see it. If you wait three weeks, you won't even see the seed. There's nothing there. And this one will be this tall. Try it. I'll, I'll dare you to try this. This is what will happen. And this one will go real tall. And then this one will start to grow. It'll be about that high. And about a couple weeks after that, this one on the right with the shallow soil will leaf out and then it'll start to bend over. And all of a sudden, three weeks later, the one in the deep soil will triple all in one shot all the way up and it'll start to produce fruit. And this one on the right won't produce fruit, the one on with shallow soil. You want to know why? Because the root system is not deep enough to support the nutrients to make the plant produce the fruit. It's a, it has to go, the roots have to go out shallow to get the plant to grow up. So it grows up real fast. You do that the same in our life. A Christian does that when you get excited. We, we get up real excited. We get a burst of faith and a burst of energy. 
And we go, yeah, and you grow up, but we don't have a root system. So when something comes along and says, you're wrong, or you hear the media, we fall apart like a $2 suitcase. If you wait and slow down and get a revelation of what God's telling you, you may not see something happen at first, but that root system will start to grow, and then it starts to come up. And then when you get a revelation, nobody can convince you otherwise of the truth. Once you know the truth and have a revelation of that in that root system, then you can face adversity and face difficult situations. Every, nobody is immune to difficult situations in your life. Every person here has a different situation going on probably right now. Nobody's got a perfect life, myself included. But we've got to deal with it, and we face the world by dealing with, with Jesus. Is everybody following me so far? So being a humble and, and creating a humble heart and sharing that and learning that is just a vital part that I've learned that's helped me grow in my relationship with God. For a long time, I've always wanted God to use me and God has wanted to use me, but I forgot or wasn't told or wasn't taught that God moves through people and he has to have a usable vessel to use. You don't have to be qualified. God hasn't had anybody qualified to work for him yet. That's not the point. All you got to do is be usable. <laughs> Moses wasn't qualified. Moses was petrified. He didn't want to get used. He was terrified. He was so terrified that he told, and God told Moses, okay, I'll go with you to Israel. And Moses was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean? You, you were, there was a question like, because you weren't going to come with us? He got caught off guard. He's like, if you don't go in front of me, I'm not going anywhere. Well, that's as simple as that. It's either you go or I don't go. So <laughs> that's, that's a, what a humble heart is. So I want to share a scripture with you today out of the first book of Chronicles. This is uh, David. And David is coming to the end of his life. And this is a really neat passage of scripture that means a lot to me. And this will help. In the second or the first book of Chronicles in chapter 29, this is David coming to the end of his life and he's getting older on age and he's getting things in a fair and he has all the people of Israel gathered together. And he does a little thing. And what he says here in verse 18 is really, really powerful. It says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of thy people, and, look at this, prepare their heart unto thee. Everybody see that word, prepare their heart? That's what we've been talking about for three weeks. This is an amazing passage of Scripture. David is saying, keep this in the hearts of the imagination of thy people and asking God to prepare their heart. Your imagination is a vital key in order for you to humble your heart and soften your heart and fix your heart and fix yourself towards God. You cannot have a humble heart without the ability to use your imagination. I'm not talking about imagination as in Disney movies and things like that. I'm talking about the, your ability to paint a picture in your heart without your eyeballs. The unseen. The unseen. Jesus said over and over and over again, if you're reading the Gospels, you always see Jesus says, those who have eyes to see, see, and those who have ears to hear. What he's talking about is your imagination. You have to have the ability to paint a picture based off of the Word of God and what God sees you, not in how you see you with your two eyeballs. What, this is really neat because if you look back here, this is um, David was at, like I said, he was at coming to the end of his age and he was getting ready to get his affairs in order. So he gathered all the people together and he made an offering to the building of the temple. Now David wanted to build the temple of the Lord, but the Lord says no. He said, no, I don't want you to build the temple of the Lord. You was a man of war, and I don't want a man of war building the temple of God. This is an Old Testament thing. And it's kind of striking because man, David was a man of war, believe it or not. And he was also called a man of God. But God didn't want him building his temple because he had been in so many battles and had seen so much death and war. So he said, your son Solomon will do it. So David said, okay, fine. 
no problem. But David went ahead and started gathering materials and funds to build a temple. And if you ever read this story, if you look back through chapter 29 earlier in this, you'll read this. But he gathered something. I read some commentaries. The government of Israel and David gathered an offering and started building a warehouse for funds to build a temple. And it was something like, in today's money, I think it was 40 or $40 billion worth of materials and funds. That's a lot of money and gold, tons of gold, like actual tons of gold. So he, he had already given $40 billion worth of funds to build a temple for the Solomon. And then he gathers, he gathers the whole country together, all of his officials and all of his other stuff, and then he himself started giving from his own personal accounts. And he gave to the temple another equivalent of $4 billion. $4 billion, not million, billion. Tons and tons of gold. You can read it. it. It shows you how many thousands of pounds of this and how many thousands of pounds of this. And if you equivalent that today's money, that's like $4 billion that David gave out of his personal bank account to the building of the temple. That's pretty good. Now you got $44 billion. And his officers and his leaders and his priests and all these generals and his leaders were so impressed by David that they started giving out of their personal accounts. And then everybody else saw what all the captains and generals and leaders were doing, and they started giving out of their accounts. And they gave another $4 billion in the same day. This all happened in one day. So in one day, they got about an $8 billion tithe offering to the building of the temple. That's a pretty good day. So everybody break out your checkbooks. And <laughs> And David was so moved by this, and he was so floored that he just began to pray and pray and praise God. I want to read you a couple of sentences that he gets to before he gets to verse 18. And in verse 14, if you back up three more verses here, David begins to pray because he's so overwhelmed at this. And he says, Who am I and what is this people that we should be able to offer such willingness of sort? For all these things have come of thee, and thy own were given of thee. This is the King James Version, but... Basically, he's saying, who, who are we to be able to even have the ability to give you this stuff? You got to remember, they were slaves in Egypt. They didn't have nothing. They had less than nothing. And David is remembering this, and he says, everything, we were strangers before that. He's talking about being in Egypt. And there were our fathers, and the days of the earth were like a shadow, and there is nothing non-abiding. This is just amazing. He's saying, who are we that we are now at a place in our life that we can give this. We had nothing, and now we have all this abundance. All this abundance came from you, God. In other words, everything in your life comes from God. God gives you the power and the ability to be prosperous. He doesn't give you prosperity. Matter of fact, in Proverbs, it says God gives you the power to be prosperous. If you're good at doing something and, you're, and you've been blessed by it, the reason why you're good at doing it is because God has allowed you to be good at doing it. Is everybody following me so far? I'll read a little more. Verse, what am I at here? 16. O Lord our God, all this store that we have had prepared in the building in these houses for thine only name and thy coming of the hand is it of thy own. I know also, God, that thou hast triest their hearts, and thou hast pleasure in the uprightness. And as for me and the being the uprightness of my heart, I will willingly offer all these things. And now I have seen the joy of the people who are present there, who are offering willing to these. He's just saying this is just absolutely amazing. Everything here that has been able to do this came from you, God. You're the reason why we have all this opportunity to bless you. He, you're the one that built this. And now everybody in the round is seeing that, and they're, they're humbling themselves for you. So he's saying this, and then he gets to verse 18. He says, Lo, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, keep this event, in other words, keep this into the hearts of the imaginations of the people and the thoughts, and prepare their heart. In other words, he's asking God to help penetrate and fix this event in the imagination of people so they don't forget because people forget. 
we leak. How many of you ever had a revelation in your life or an experience in your life that you don't forget? Everybody, you can raise your hand. That's okay. This is what he's trying to get across to the Lord. He said, Lord, please help these people make this event one of those events and, and permeate it in the imaginations of their heart and help them prepare their heart so that they don't forget who their source is. That Jesus is their source. Our job, my life too, is to do that for me. As you grow, you, God will give you an experience and you'll learn a revelation. And once you get a revelation, that paints a picture in your heart that nobody can erase. That's what a, that's what a biblical revelation is called. Once God give, gives you a revelation, it's gonna, he's going to paint a picture in your heart and nobody can talk you out of that. Once you know, you know, you know, you know. Peter did this, and I'm not going to go there, but Jesus asked Peter, who do people say I am? And he said, some people say you're Elijah, some people say you're Moses. And he said, but who do you say I am? Everybody remember that? And Peter said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded and says, no human teaching taught you that. That came by revelation of the Lord. And on that revelation, I will build my church in the Hells of gate and the sin, the hells of Satan will not prevail. Does everybody remember that? Yes. That that scripture has been taken way out of context because everybody thinks Jesus was talking to Peter that he was gonna build, Peter was gonna build the church and that was gonna be Peter's church and the hells of gates won't prevail against Peter. He wasn't talking about Peter at all. If you read that real carefully, he was talking about Peter's revelation. He says, upon this revelation, I will build the church. He didn't say, upon you, Peter. He said, upon this revelation, I will build the church. I better read that so you guys know that. <laughs> Matthew, it's in Matthew somewhere, six, 16, 17. Do I have that? Matthew chapter 16. Simon Peter, verse 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you, and you did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, Peter, which means rock, upon this rock, in other words, upon this rock of revelation, knowledge of this permeation in your imagination, of this humbling your heart and preparing your heart, and God's moved you, this piece of information, this revelation, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Has nothing to do with Peter or an individual building anything. It all has everything to do with your ability to use your imagination so God can give you a revelation of his truth. And once you know the truth, the, say, the gates of hell cannot prevail because they don't have any authority to prevail. But the only way that works is for you and me to know the truth. And the only way to know the truth is for you and me to prepare your heart. This is what David was trying to convey on this day when he said, Lord, keep this in the thoughts of their imaginations of the people and prepare their hearts. Lord, please don't let this be something that they forget. How many times have God done something miraculous in your life and you forgot about it? And then the next tragic thing comes to it and you go, oh my God, this is never going to happen again. And you forget the 75 times that God's already saved your life. That's why you got to remember things. That's why you got to read the Bible more than once a year. There's a country song, and there's something about dust on a Bible. You don't get points for having dust on your Bible. You have to actually open it up and read the thing. The words in here will count. But you can have an experience that will do that. Everybody has these experiences. Everybody has a revelation. This is what he's talking about. You can have a revelation. Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was. And Jesus recognized it and said, that's it. That's the revelation that I'm going to build my church on. And that will never forget. Most of us have had a revelation like that before. 
I've been a Christian all my life since I was five years old. I grew up in church. I know God loved me. But it wasn't for a long, long time before I started getting major revelations on how to God's word works. If you know me long enough, Mark chapter 4 is what changed my life. Once I realized that the word of God works just like a seed and it worked on the same principles, that changed my life. That was a revelation for me that nobody ever can talk me out of. Once I knew how the word of God worked and the principles and the laws and the natural and spiritual laws and how God's word worked, that changed my life. And nobody can tell me otherwise. Sorry. Then two of us would be wrong. <laughs> Too late. God wants to do that for every one of you. Whatever that revelation is, there's different revelations. God wants to do that, but the only way to do that is for me to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to me and to me to be, make myself humble enough and more God-dependent and less independent. The problem with most people is everybody wants to be a self-made person. I did it myself. I can do this. God's not looking for a self-made person. He wants to be a God-made person. God's plan A was always to live in the midst of his people. There is no plan B. There never was a plan B. So what you see in your heart is what you're going to end up doing. You remember in the book of Proverbs, it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Whatever you picture you paint in your heart is eventually what you're going to do in the physical realm, whether you like it or not. You can't go a different direction in your life than based on what your heart is. If your heart is fixed on something, whatever that fixed is, is eventually what you are going to do. Now, you could do something temporarily for a little while, but you'll always end up going the direction on whatever the direction your heart is fixed at. Because that's a law. It works just like gravity. You can like it or not like it. It doesn't make any difference. You can visualize things. That's what your imagination is for. Everybody here uses your imagination. You have to. But you can visualize what God has for you without seeing it. I've said that you, everybody in here, if I asked you how many windows do you have in your house, nobody here has counted all your windows in your house, except for you. But every person in here, you can go through and you can tell me how many windows in your house. You don't know how? You got to use your imagination. You can picture your house. So you go walk in there. I got one to the left. There's over the kitchen. There's a sliding glass door. And I go down the hall. And then there's this one. And you can go through and you can count all the windows in your house. But you're not seeing it because you're using your imagination. What we need to do is use that same imagination that God gave you to understand what God gave you. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You know what that is? That's everything that you have already in your spirit. All of them together. It's one fruit. It's not plural. To use that same imagination that you have to count your windows to think, I have joy. What does that look like? I have peace. What does that look like? I have patience. Yes, you really do. Trust me. I know you don't share it very much when you go to Walmart when someone cuts you off. You have patience. You can visualize things before you do them, and that's what you do. I was a chef for a long time, and I've probably shared this, but that's okay. When I used to write menus, I used to, be the, I used to write all the menus out for multiple restaurants, and the way I would write menus was a little bit different. I would visualize the finished product that I wanted to see, and then I would write the recipes backwards to fit what I wanted to see in the finished product so that I could give it to the prep crew and I could have the right prep crew in the right increments so that they would make the right sizes and increments that I wanted to see on the plate. Mm -hmm. And I was writing a menu with another chef that we were working together with a restaurant, and he saw what I was doing a little bit, and he asked me, what are you doing? And I said, I just work backwards. I visualize what I want to see, and I see it in my mind, and I write and I work backwards from there. I deconstruct it, and then I write the recipes. And he said, that is the weirdest thing on the planet. I have never seen anybody do that. But you know what? I had very, very little reprints. Whenever I made something, it was, it was almost 90% correct whenever I made something. Very little reprints. Because you know why? I saw it. 
I knew what it was supposed to look like when I saw it. And when I saw the people prepping, I said, no, that's too big. I want it smaller or this or this or this or whatever. It's too thick because I had the finished look imprinted in my brain on what I wanted to do. Does that make sense to everybody? You can do the same thing in your walk with God. God can give you a vision, and God can give you something, a, a revelation of his love or prosperity or healing or just anything, peace or patience or holding. He can give you that. And once you get that picture, paint it in your mind, and you can do that because God is with you doing that. If you can't paint a picture, you can't do it. Let me put it the other way. Abraham and Sarah said the same thing. I'm, not gonna, I'm going fast. Am I going too fast? In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, Abraham said, if they had been mindful from the place they had been, they might have been tempted to go back. He's talking about Abraham and Sarah moving out of the Ur of Chaldees. In other words, if they had been thoughtful from when they came from, they could have been tempted. If you read that backwards, it says, if you are not willingly understanding, if you can't imagine where you're from, you can't be tempted. In other words, you can't do anything that you can't imagine. If you can't imagine, you can do it. Remember the Tower of Babel in the Genesis chapter 7? The Lord came down to see a report, and he says, all these people are in one accord, speaking together in the building buildings. And he said one very important thing. He says, after this, whatever they can imagine, they can accomplish. And so he split them up to slow that process down. Whatever you can imagine, you can accomplish because that's the way God designed you and designed the world. That's a law. Whatever you focus on is what imprints this picture. And whatever that picture is, is what steers your subconscious and conscience and what makes your actions and your sub-actions, what makes you talk, what makes you speak, and how and then that has the effect. If you want to change something in your life, you have to change the picture in here. Not out here. And the only way to change the picture in here is by preparing your heart. You have to make a decision to fix your heart and be acceptable for God to do something for you. I think that's soaking a little bit. Mm-hmm. You've got to have, everybody here has these things going on. And I, I got a revelation one time that when I realized that how God operates based on me on who I am in spirit, soul, and body, and I have three parts to me, and God deals with me based on who I am in my spirit, not based on my performance or my willingness, that's another revelation I had. That'll change my life. Period. I, like, I didn't learn that 12, 15 years ago, and I've been a Christian for 25 years before that. I knew God loved me, but I always based my relationship with Jesus on something I did or didn't do. And once I realized that it's not based on that, Jesus based my relationship on who I am in the spirit. Because God is a spirit, we must worship him in the spirit. That changed my life forever. That took all the weight off of trying to be a Christian. It takes all the work out of trying to be a Christian. Because you can't be a Christian anyways by yourself. It's too much work. It's impossible. The only way to do it is with Jesus because it's a relationship. It's okay to use your imagination. You got to paint a picture that's permanent so you remember things. I remember, I'll tell you one quick story, then we'll do this. I have an uncle, his name is uh, Terry. He lives in the northern peninsula of Michigan, and uh, he's retired. He's a Vietnam vet. And he comes out to the Arizona as a snowbird comes out, and he always comes out in the winter times. He hasn't come out in a while. This is 15, 20 years ago. So this is a long time ago. And he likes to go garage sailing when he comes out here and do his thing and do all that stuff. He loves that. And he likes to buy old cars because out in Arizona, they don't have any rust on them like they do back east. So he goes and he finds a, an old 64 Chevy pickup truck side-by-side thing. It looks nice, and he buys the truck. We're going to restore it and buy it. Okay, that's fine. So we travel around. Next week later, he sees another car, and he buys a monstrous 1974 two-ton dump truck, a great big dump truck, a huge, humongous dump truck. 
and we, it was all rusty, so he wanted to paint it. We paint the thing blue. I helped him paint. We painted the whole truck blue and out in the back 40 there. And I never asked him this, but he was there for a couple months. I'm wondering, he lives in Michigan. How is he going to get this back here? He's like, oh, we're going to drive it back here. Okay, well, fine. And then we go a little longer. Then he buys another Chevy truck. Now we've got two Chevy trucks and a dump truck. And a couple weeks later, he buys a car. I'm just, this is just, just a true story. He buys a little Honda car. He's buying cars. Then he buys a Harley Davidson motorcycle. I'm like, I don't know. He's a pretty ingenious guy. And then I'll tell you, I'll, this, he's crazy. Don't get me wrong, he's crazy. <laughs> He's got this chainsaw, and he got a, we carved a tree. Now, we had a big pond in our backyard, and he carved an alligator out of a, out of a log with a chainsaw. You ever seen people do that on the TV? He did that. We got a, a five-and-a-half-foot alligator out of a wood log that he carved out of a chainsaw. And so he asked me, we're going to go back to Michigan. How are we going to do this? I'm like, I, what are you looking at me for? <laughs> so he's all, oh, we'll figure it out. So he built a ramp. And a dug a ditch with a tractor, and, and he had the dump truck, and we put one of the trucks in backwards inside the dump truck, and he built the ramp over the top, and we put another truck over the top on top of the truck in the truck on the dump truck. You follow me so far? <laughs> and then he, we built a tow hitch with the way bar slings and towed the car behind the dump truck, and then we put the motorcycle on top of the truck with the truck on top of the truck and put the alligator on top of the motorcycle. <laughs> so you got... <laughs> I got pictures. I'll show you this. You can't make this stuff up. You see, you have you got a five foot alligator while the on riding a Harley on top of an S10 Chevy pickup truck inside of a '64 pickup truck inside of a dump truck that's towing a car. <laughs> you really can't make this stuff up. I'm oh yeah, we got pulled over. I got pulled over in Oklahoma with him, and the cop was so petrified by us, he just told us to leave. <laughs> He said, how far away from you? We were like an hour and a half away from um, the Missouri border. And he just said, go. I don't ever want to see you again. He didn't know how to write a ticket. He's like, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do. <laughs> he just wanted to look at it. And do you make things worse? We take out of here a Cornville. And I get to Cornville Road and I-17. You know where that is? And uh, the clutch blew on the transmission on the dump truck. So we were stuck there for a week to put a new clutch in there. It took us, a no, normal trip I think takes about two days, two and a half days to drive there to northern Michigan. It took us like 14 days. Because you can only go 32 miles an hour. It was, uh, it was uh, anyways. You know why I say all that? All of you now are picturing this crazy guy with a dump truck and all this stuff. Because you're using your imagination. That, that's, that's how you use it. But we have to learn... That when you read the Bible, allow your imagination, allow God to paint this picture. When the Bible says, you are holy, you have peace, you are my precious child, you have love. I love you, you're here, I'll never leave you or forgive you. Jesus said that, I'll never leave you. Paint that picture. Forsake. Oh, I'll never forsake you. Yes, sorry. I'm sp my heart is going faster than my mouth. God designed you in his image, and part of that being is your ability to use your heart and your imagination. God wants to do that. Unfortunately, we just shut that part off, and we shut that valve off, and we don't allow God to move in our life. When God's not the one that's waiting to move, God's waiting for you to open the valve up like a faucet so he, the Holy Spirit can move through you. And the best way to do that is to prepare your heart. And another word for that is to be humble your heart or to fix your heart or to establish your heart or make a decision to use your imagination to paint a picture on what the Bible says who you are. Hope that makes sense. Amen? Amen. That was worth coming to church for, wasn't it? Yeah, it was worth it. I'm going to do something a little different here. We're going to take communion today. I want to take communion today. And when I, we do this today, I'm going to cut a little short today. I want to read a passage of the Bible, and as we do this, we're going to conduct an experiment, and you're all going to use your imagination to paint a picture. Uh -oh. 
Jesus said in the Last Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Does everybody remember that? Where am I at here? I'm trying to go to Isaiah. Take this cup and drink it and do this in remembrance of me. He said, remember this twice. You know why he told everybody to remember it? How do you remember something? You got to use your imagination to remember something. This is powerful. The word of God is powerful and it's alive. And he commanded us to do communion together and remember what he did for you. The biggest thing we have to do is to is remember what Jesus did so that we have the opportunity to be blessed, to be whole, to be called righteous. That all came possible because of you. Did you guys get some? We're missing some, huh? I'm going to read some scriptures here as you guys get this ready. And I'm just going to read out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Isaiah wrote this, I think I read some commentary, uh, somewhere around 800 years before Jesus was born. And he wrote verbatim of what, Jesus was, gonna ha- what was going to happen to Jesus. And I'm going to read a little bit. This is talking about Jesus, 800 years before he was born. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we, and we thought his troubles were just a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole, and he was whipped so we could be healed. Now, I'm going to take that into context and stop real quick. When Jesus said, take this bread for as my body so that you could be whole, he was referring to this right here. He was beaten so you could be whole. His body was beaten so that your body could be whole, not just your mental body, your physical body. He says, he was pierced for your rebellion and crushed for his sins. He said, take this cup, this is my blood, which is my new covenant for you. That is what he's talking about, verse 5 here. He was pierced for your sins. He had to pay a price for you to be righteousness. And he had to bleed for you to be righteousness. This all happened in prophecy 800 years ago. I'm going to read a little more. All of us like sheep straight away. And he left God's path to follow our own. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. You could really go into this. I'm just kind of reading this. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb led to slaughter, a sheep with a silent before the shears, and he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, and he never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal and was put in a rich man's grave. But there was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. That scripture always caught me off guard. It was God's good plan to crush Jesus for his own sake. Yet in his life, he made an offering for our sin. He will have many descendants and enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteouses. Everybody get that? That's verse 11. My righteousness servant, Jesus, will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all of their sins. Not some of their sins, all of them. All of them. That word all in the Greek means everything. All. All. Because he exposed himself to death, he was counted among rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. So when Jesus said, do this, take this bread in remembrance of me, for this is my body, it is broken for you, he literally meant his physical body was going to break for your ability to be whole. Let's eat.
And he said, take this cup. This is my new covenant. We live in a new covenant based off of grace, not works. And that had to be paid with a price because he was pierced for all sins, not one. Everything. Amen. If you get a chance to read Isaiah chapter 53, I'd really encourage it. That was some of the most inspiring pieces of scripture that in the Bible. And you got to give Isaiah a little bit of props there for it. He said that hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And he was, that was right down to the T. Everything happened exactly the same way, right down to where he was buried and everything. That's just amazing to me because the Bible is true. This is, I hope you learned something. I think you all did. Your brains are full. Spirit's full. Jesus has a painting picture for you and me because he's always here, always with you. I just got to remember to allow him to move through me and say, God, what do you want me to do? Make me usable. Help me. Instead of me going, I'll do this, God. Thank you, and you, and you bless me, God. And it's the opposite way around. Ask God to use you, and he'll bless you. Amen?